Okay, so uh, first I should say thank you very much to the NADP for inviting us to give this online webinar. And what we're going to be talking about is uh, a study we've done over the last three years to evaluate audio feedback with a particular slant on looking at whether it's an inclusive approach. So first I'd like to introduce myself and my co-presenters. So I'm Carl Nightingale and I'm an academic. I teach on lots of programs, uh, mostly in the biological sciences. So uh, programs like medicine and biomedical sciences and pharmacy and dentistry. So I'm a sort of scientist, but I'm also interested in educational uh, research. And I also work with these two other people. So maybe Vicky, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Vicky Anderson, Learning Support Advisor with the Student Disability Service at the University of Birmingham, um, supporting a whole range of, of students throughout the cohorts with, with a range of disabilities. Okay, and uh, Sue Onans? Hi, I'm Sue Onans. I'm Inclusivity Advisor at the University of Birmingham. A fairly new role, but interested in uh, teaching and learning and the wider student experience. Okay, so that's a, a sort of introduction to us. And I think what we'd like to say is that this is going to be about 40 minutes long. And one way you can ask questions is by using the chat function. But uh, because a lot of people use the chat function to make comments, could you introduce or start off any questions with a cue? So cue and then your question, and then it's sort of a signal for us to pay attention. And we'll, try, we'll get to all your questions at the end of the recording. Okay, so I think that's everything. Are we all ready to go over? Right, so I'm sharing my screen. And hopefully we can all see the presentation. Can you see it, uh, you two? Very good. Right, so this is our, our presentation and it's all about audio feedback and our study, which is over the last three years, to evaluate how audio feedback actually works in diverse undergraduate programs. And particularly in the context of the NADP, we're going to be looking at how, how specific groups of students, those disclosing a whole range of disabilities, uh, perceive and make use of this type of feedback. As we've already said, we're from the University of Birmingham in the UK. And the last thing I've got here is, is my contact details. So please send me any questions that you think of later, or maybe you, uh, you've got an idea and you think you'd like to um, uh, do a study with us. We'd be very interested to talk to you about your ideas. Right, so I think the first thing is to talk about what actually the context of, of this uh, study. And so all of us know that assessment and feedback is a problematic area in higher education. In the UK, we have this thing called the National Student Survey. So what this tells us is how undergraduates perceive their programme. And every year, assessment and feedback is one of the areas where it's clear the students are less satisfied than other aspects of their courses. And so it's been focused in the UK for a long time, but clearly it's an important area internationally. So why do students have problems with assessment and feedback? Well, part of it might be because it's simply just different from what they experienced in school. If you think about our assessment methods in higher education, they tend to be one way. So what does that mean? It means an assessor, someone like me, is telling a student what they've done right and what they've done wrong. And there's not very much opportunity for the student to actually come back and actually talk to me or refine their ideas. It tends to be one way. I deliver it, they receive it. Likewise, assessment is nearly always high stakes or summative. Every time students do a piece of assessment, it nearly always contributes to their final mark. So particularly in the UK, we talk quite a lot about formative assessment, so stuff that does not contribute to your mark, but it isn't actually as large a component as maybe it should be. The other thing that is also a problem, is perhaps other than this entire context, 
is that assessors don't seem to be doing as good a job as students actually want them to do. So often if you ask students what do they think about their feedback, they're often saying that it's too general, it's too vague, it uses unfamiliar terms, it's not feeding forward, it's not helping them to do better next time. And one of, so this in inability to feed forward is a really big problem because if, if, if the feedback is not helping you to get better, why would you engage with it? And this is part of the issue. So there's now literature that showed that students often don't address the areas of concern raised in feedback, perhaps because they don't understand it or they don't understand what to do to make it better. And another aspect uh, about students is that they don't, they can't look at their own work and give it a mark that is close to what an assessor would. So they can't judge whether their mark is, is high quality or low quality. And they don't get better at this as they go through programs. I think the last thing to think about is, is that recently it's been recognized that students' emotions are clearly a really important part of the feedback process. If you think about when the last time someone assessed you, it feels like they are assessing you as a person so the work that you put in is being judged good or bad. And obviously this is an emotional response. It's a judgment on you and your work. And clearly that can be a big barrier for students to engage. If you're being told your work is rubbish, you feel rubbish, then this is a really, really big issue in actually engaging with that work and all that feedback. Okay, so these are the, some of the issues that are actually present in higher education, what about audio feedback? So when we're talking about audio feedback in this study, we're talking about the online delivery of an audio recording. The students send us a piece of work online and the assessor makes a recording and actually this is delivered back online through a virtual learning environment to the student. So this sort of approach has been around for many years, particularly in language teaching, and there's quite a large literature. And, and the literature on this is very encouraging. So compared with written feedback, audio feedback is more engaging. Students think it's more convenient, it's more detailed, it's more encouraging, it's more directed. Lots, lots of positive things about audio feedback. And to me, this makes a lot of sense, simply because I as an assessor can say an awful lot more in five minutes than I can write in five minutes. So naturally, if I give the same amount of time, the feedback is going to be more detailed and it's going to be more helpful to the student. Another thing that might be very important is the fact that when you're actually watching or listening to an assessor, there's more information in that than in a written feedback. So you, what you can hear is you can hear intonation, you can hear the, the assessor's immediate response and how they might change their mind as they're working through the feedback. So this, this idea that the, the recipient student can actually get into the mind of the assessor and partially understand why the, the assessor's thinking the way they are. And that might also be an important part of why audio feedback is useful. Right, so what did our study actually aim to do? So what we do is we're comparing two individual types of feedback. On one hand, we're using written feedback, which is the standard way of giving feedback on two different programs. The programs we're looking at are biomedical sciences, which is a bit like biochemistry. It's a year one program with 150 students. And the second program we're looking at is pharmacy which is a smaller cohort with 50 students. So we're looking at written feedback in one example, and then we're going to look at how that compares with audio feedback. So two different types of feedback and compare and contrast. So what are we going to do? Both of these types of feedback are going to be submitted and generated online, and assessors mark them using SpeedGrader, which is a sort of standard tool on our Canvas DLE. In both cases, we're using a range of assessors and different sorts of approaches to audio feedback. So we're trying to work out what's best practice 
and what is there about a audio feedback on its own rather than an individual assessor's approach. We used two different questionnaires, one which was asking students about written feedback and one about audio feedback. And in both cases, we invited students to focus groups. And then because we wanted to, to understand what audio feedback, how it was be, being received by the entire cohort, in our case, we also asked students uh, to disclose a number of protected characteristics. So some, uh, we asked them to disclose, for example, whether they had a wide range of disabilities and or uh, specific learning difficulties. We asked them to identify their ethnicity and we asked students that were international or non-English speaking backgrounds to also identify. So what this means is that we can hone in on these students and their perceptions as well as looking at the general cohort. Right, so let's go into the data. So I think the first thing is to look at how written feedback is actually being perceived on a number of different programs. So what we've got here is two different programs. In this case, it's a postgraduate program. And in this lower case, what we're looking at is year two pharmacy. And we're looking at students' comments at different stages of the feedback process. So the very first column here is, did the students read the assessment guidelines? And if they said yes, it's a green tick. And if they said no, it's an orange cross. And then we asked, were they satisfied with their mark? Did they engage with the feedback? So did they read it fully and think about it? And then did they actually rewrite, read it prior to the next similar assignment? So are they using it in the long term? And what you can see is as you go through this feedback process in both programs, what you start off with is a high level of engagement. In this case, 95% of people are looking at the assessment guidelines. But once you give them their feedback, you start to get a significant percentage of the cohort are not happy or they're not satisfied. So you can see in postgraduates, it's about 20%. In year two pharmacy, it's around 30% are not satisfied with their mark. And what this tends to mean is that those students do not engage fully with their feedback. So we have a higher percentage of students that are not engaging with their feedback. And then later on, when it comes to a later assessment, that ideally this feedback would feed forward onto, they're stating, or a significant percentage of the cohort are stating that they're not looking at it again. And they're giving us reasons. So roughly 20% in this case are saying the feedback was not to home or they forgot to use it. And what is even what more worrying is that a significant percentage of these students are saying the feedback was of no use or relevance. So basically they're dismissing it. They're saying it's of no use to them. So clearly we've got problems in these two programs in the level of satisfaction and engagement with feedback. And these are fairly typical. We see this in quite a few different programs, even in postgraduates that you would expect would be maybe a little bit more academically literate and a little bit more literate about the assessment process. So there are clearly barriers with written feedback. Right, so let's try and understand what those barriers are. So the first thing is we ask students, well, why are you dissatisfied with your mark? So here we are, we've got a set statement. I was satisfied with my mark, and we're looking in biomedical sciences, three cohorts, so this is 351 students. And when we ask this question, were you satisfied with our mark, your mark? 39% of the students said no, they were not. So why were they not happy with their mark? Well, for a range of different reasons. Some of them, the majority said that the mark was lower than they were expected, or that it did not recognize the work they put in, or it did not recognize the quality of their work. And some students, 7%, said the assessor was biased against them as an individual. There's also this issue here, this concerns about consistency. And this reflects that biomedical science is a large cohort. So what happens? is that the marking is split between multiple assessors. 
And so, of course, the students are always concerned that the marks from one assessor may be more lenient or higher than the marks from another assessor. And so this is a perennial problem in larger cohorts when you've got multiple assessors. So what we've got here is a whole range of reasons why students are not happy or are dissatisfied with their mark. But I hope you also recognise that a lot of these are to do with emotional responses. They're to do with being disappointed with the mark. It's not anything actually that the assessors are doing, except possibly not explaining why the mark is lower. So, so this is about an emotional response in this case. Right, what else? So we also looked at other reasons for why the students were unhappy. And here's the second question. It's about whether they engaged with their feedback. So the question was, I read the feedback thoroughly and thought about what I would do differently next time. And in this case, again, biomedical sciences, 350 students, so three cohorts of three years, 30% of the students disagreed with this statement. So why are they disagreeing? Well, these are the reasons which we are all familiar with. The comments were too brief. It was not clear what I had to do to improve. The com comments are too general or not specific, and the mark was sufficient feedback. And what is interesting is that all of these are reasons that we've heard over and over again in the literature. And it's suggesting that for whatever reason, assessors are unable or unwilling to give a feedback that satisfies students' feed forward needs. Right. So we, I think we now understand what the issues are with written feedback. What about audio feedback? So what we've got here is an overview of the assessment processes in year two pharmacy. And this is the, the summation of two academic cohorts. Where we've, we've either done written feedback and asked a questionnaire, or we've done audio feedback and had a similar questionnaire. And so what we're looking at here is the summation or an overview of what the students think. So we've already seen this data, haven't we? This is saying that written feedback is actually not very, uh, the students on the whole are not as happy as they maybe should be. 30 to 40% are dissatisfied with their mark, 30 to 40% are not engaging with their feedback, even at a later point. So clearly something is not right here. What about audio feedback? Is it better? And the answer is yes, but not really massively different. What is going on here? So if you still ask about the mark and satisfaction with the mark, clearly a larger percentage of the students are happier with their mark. Now we justify that or think about that in that the assessors are giving more explanation. So they're explaining maybe why their mark is different. What is important here, I think, is the percentage of students that are stating that they are engaging with their feedback. And what we've got here is here we've got 30 or 40 percent of the students are not engaging. Here we're getting down to the tens to twenties. And we've got a significant percentage of more students that are stating they're engaging with their feedback. And then the interesting thing in this programme is that we asked whether the students actually looked at this feedback prior to the next assessment. And whereas in the first, in with written feedback, a significant percentage of students are saying it's of no use or relevance to me. In the second, in audio feedback, what they're saying is that they forgot to use it, but they're not saying that it's of no relevance. So they recognise its value, but they're forgetting to use it. Now, interestingly, what we also were able to do here is to actually look at the downloads, the, so the number or the percentage of students that actually access this stuff on the VLE. And interestingly, the level of engagement is reasonably similar. So audio feedback per se is not more engaging. The students say they're engaging with it more, and probably these, these students are but as an entire cohort, the level of engagement is still relatively disappointing. Okay, so let's go in and work out why there are differences between written and audio feedback. 
I think the first, this is perhaps the most uh, interesting slide. So this is, we asked, I prefer audio feedback to written feedback. And we've done this now in six or seven cohorts on lots of different disciplines. And you always get the same sort of response. 70 to 80% of the students agree that they would rather have written feedback, sorry, they'd rather have audio feedback. So why is that? They tell us that the feedback is more detailed. They tell us the feedback is more personal and bespoke, by which we understand that it is more personal and bespoke to their work. It's not about the interpersonal in interaction as much as it's, it's clearly about their work and their errors or what they've done well. The feedback is more understandable and the feedback is clear. So clearly a large percentage of the cohort is preferring audio feedback because of the level of detail that we can give them. What is also important is that it isn't suiting everyone. So what we've seen here is that 21% are either neutral or disagree that audio feedback is preferable. So why is that? Well, roughly 6% of the cohort say there's no difference between audio and written feedback. There's no difference. And then interestingly, it's always the same. 10 to 15% say that they would rather have a paper copy and that they can reflect more easily on written material. And this is what they're not getting when you get a, a, a recording on, on, online. Now, the worrying thing in the context of the NADP, of course, is who are these students? Could it be that these students are the students of the ones that are disclosing FPLDs? Are we actually creating, solving one problem and creating another for another class of students? So this is what we also focused in on. Right, so to, 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 then we went into focus groups, and we've done quite a lot of focus groups to try and understand what students tell us, why is it that audio feedback is better? And what about audio feedback is worse than written feedback? And these are the main themes that came back. So the first one is that audio feedback is more detailed and specific. And that seems to make sense. I can say a lot more in five minutes than I can write. The second one is also more interesting in some ways. The fact that a recorded voice actually carries intonation, it, it carries stresses, it carries, it's a more informal sort of language. There's more communication in an audio recording than there is in, in written recording. So here's a nice example. So here's a student that clearly has engaged with something in an audio recording. One thing that you definitely get from audio feedback that you don't get from writing is that you can tell by their tone and that does contribute. So if they're like, oh yeah, it's really good, then you feel good. But if it's well like mine, it was, whoa, and it had its effect. So I was like, oh God, okay, right. I need to try and sort that out for the next one. So this is the feeling that that there is a communication or an emotional element of audio feedback that actually really does um, impact on students and gets them to, to engage with what they're doing well and what they're doing badly. The third one is that the technology is convenient, but this is the same now for written and audio feedback. Both are delivered online via the same thing. So what is maybe not so good about audio feedback? I think the first thing is that audio feedback can be less structured. Typically, if you talk to many students, they think that assessors use a narrative approach to, to the assessment in audio feedback. So they start at the start of a piece of work and they work their way through it. And this is less structured than what often what they're doing in written feedback, where often the comments are put in under criteria in boxes which allow the students to understand what their priorities are and what may be the, the, the take home message is from, from the assessment is. So this idea that audio feedback can be less structured is maybe important. The other thing that comes up sometimes is that the equivalent of annotation is not so obvious in audio feedback. So contextualizing what you're talking about in what part of the essay or the, the work is actually more difficult. 
and the assessor has to be more aware that they have to put markers or highlights or somehow think about the, how the students are going to understand what they're talking about when they're talking about. And then I think the third thing that maybe explain some of our feed forward activity is that when you talk to many students, they have a, uh, the, the, the value or the impression made from a, an audio recording is maybe not as convenient or as useful or as impactful as a piece of paper with, with, with a summary on. And so this may well explain why it's not being, why audio feedback's not being used uh, at later on when you come to the next assessment, uh, maybe because an audio recording is, is a more transient or it's, it's a more difficult thing to access and, and to accommodate into your work. Right, so, so that's uh, me talking about the general uh, cohort. Now I'm going to hand over to Vicky, uh, who's going to talk about the qualitative focus groups we did with students disclosing disabilities. Okay, so it's interesting to give you a flavour of the student voice and what our students disclosing disabilities said about the, um, the experience of having audio feedback. All of the um, focus group members talked about the, the lack of detail or the, the amount of detail in their feedback and also the importance of contextualised feedback. So um, it was interesting to see a comment from um, a student disclosing mental health difficulties where they said sometimes I'd write something and it would be good but they tend to expand more on the bad points. I need to know why it's good so I can apply it next time. Some commented, or several students um, commented in these focus groups that written feedback can be impersonal and that they often felt that the same statements could be made to multiple students. Some of our students commented that um, audio feedback was an improvement because of the specificity and because of the use of examples um, that gave them clear points as to where their work could be improved. Can I have the next slide, please? Students that we spoke to um, who disclosed dyslexia um, referred to the information processing, working memory side of things. Um, so comments such as they preferred to work through the auditory channel, they, when they heard something they could understand it more, they could process the information more easily. So in my head I'm more likely to remember somebody talking, it sticks more with voice, I forget what I've read easily. Um, they also commented on the fact that it was good to be able to go back to listen to it again and again to reinforce the points that were made. However, some students with dyslexia commented that they needed a visual example and they needed a concrete reference to go back to because they didn't remember everything that had been said. Next one, please. A comment from um, a student um, disclosing mental health difficulties was that when they received written feedback, they found it sort of a bit anxiety making to, to go and approach the lecturer afterwards and say, can you expand on this point that you've made? And they commented that because the audio feedback was more detailed, because the points had already been expanded on in the audio feedback, they didn't need to worry about arranging to see the lecturer or communicating with the lecturer and asking them to expand in that way. So it reduced the feelings of nervousness because they knew it was all there and they knew they could re-listen to it in their own time. Um, Again, being able to listen again and the contextualised nature of the feedback was um, regarded as being a benefit by some students. However, 
some students disclosing dyslexia commented on how difficult they found it to process verbal content and when they're just listening to somebody it wasn't enough for them. So various pros and cons were voiced by our students declaring disabilities. Um, the comments from students with dyspraxia were particularly interesting. They tended to revolve around structure. So for example, a student said, um, when somebody talks, they're not using bullet points. And when I hear it, it's all a bit more jumbled. They needed that structure that the written feedback could give them. I think it's worth reading out the, the whole of, of the next quote. Structure is incredibly good for anybody with dyspraxia. We need a framework to work with. You can't just have somebody rambling on the tape. When you read something off a piece of paper or off a computer screen, you have no intonation on the other hand. And for some students with dyspraxia, the intonation gave them cues and actually enabled them to get far more back from the feedback and to structure through the intonation that was given in the audio feedback. There was one student who Carl has mentioned the emotional response and how it can be more impactful. Um, student with dyspraxia said that although it might be a bit unnerving to register a critical tone, they would rather that happened so that it would alert them to something that they needed to pay attention to as they put it a red flag that might be glaringly obvious to other people but not for them and that's something that they found the verbal feedback gave them a much better idea of. One of the dyslexic students we talked to interestingly said that they listened to the audio feedback, typed out what had been said, and then had it in written format for the, for the next time they were preparing an essay. So in actual fact for them, it ended up being written feedback. Some students with specific learning difficulties said that they might benefit from having a combination of audio and written feedback given that there were positive and negative aspects to each and some commented on the benefits of being able to see the essay actually being or the work being marked up as the audio feedback was being given. So I'm just going to hand over to Carl now for him to to sum up some of our findings. Okay so I think the last thing to do is to talk about how, how audio and written feedback compare when we're thinking about student satisfaction and how much students actually engage with the feedback. And what we've got on this graph is an indication of how this is perceived and the differences between different components of our diverse cohorts. So what you can see here on the right is we've got different categories of students that they have either disclosed or identified as. And so there are different ethnicities here, but also we have students that are identifying as either international students or they're disclosing a wide range of uh, SPLDs or disabilities. And so I guess in this context, we're going to be talking about these students, the red dots. So if we look at it here, what we've got on the left is we've got satisfaction, student satisfaction with their marks, with either written or audio feedback, and their stated level of engagement with that feedback, again, either with written or audio feedback. And the way to look at this is to see how disparate there are with different groups of students in these cohorts. So what we have here is a large group of students that are roughly saying, well, 70 to 75 percent of white and Asian students are saying that they're happy with their marks. But what is also clear is that we've got a number of categories of students here that are clearly not happy with their mark, much lower percentages of, of satisfaction with their mark. And these include the red dots, the students disclosing SPLDs or disabilities. 
So what we have here is a, a real marked difference between perceptions with feedback in different parts of the cohort. So again, this is written feedback, but when we go to audio feedback, you can see the whole level of all these students are on the whole much happier with their mark and we're seeing marked increases in satisfaction with their mark. Now, how can we justify that? I think this must be to do with the explanation, the level of explanation that the assessor is giving in audio feedback. What about the level of engagement? So again, what we have in written feedback is a range of levels of engagement depending on uh, different categories of students and what they're disclosing. But again, you can see the red dots, the students that are disclosing a wide range of disabilities are towards the bottom end of the cohort. They're not engaging as much as other students. And again, when we go to audio feedback, we're seeing a marked increase in engagement, but clearly there's still an issue here. Students with disclosing SPLDs are not engaging as much as the rest of the students in the cohort. So what we've got here is a marked increase in satisfaction uh, with their marks for all students, but markedly so for students disclosing SPLDs or disabilities, and also an increase in engagement with their feedback. But again, we're not addressing all of the issues for these students. Right, so I'm going to now hand over, oh no, we've got some one, one more slide, which are basically the take-homes from this study. So these are the general take-homes that we think uh, are, are appropriate for this study. The first thing is that audio feedback is very well received. That seems to be generally accepted by almost everyone in the country. Uh, everyone is, is telling us there's a high level of engagement with their feedback and it seems to be highly valued and that seems to reflect the level of detail that's actually coming in the feedback. As an academic I feel that it's distinct from written feedback. They are, it's a different sort of thing. It's more informal, it's more detailed, there's also a level of interpersonal or emotional uh, relevance to audio feedback that you don't give in written feedback. And I think that's important for some students and it might have a different effect. It might be, it's more immediate. It, it makes students reflect more. And I think the last thing is to point out that it does seem to have inclusive elements, but it, this obviously needs to be, we need to think very carefully about what best practice actually means for students uh, across the cohort. So, uh, we've raised the idea that some students particularly need an explicit structure or a balance of positive and negative comments, and this is something maybe to focus on in audio feedback. I also think that one trick maybe to think about is to encourage students to, to reflect on their audio feedback, maybe they may that another activity to make them identify what the main take-homes are, so for allowing them to to reflect and to add structure to what, what is perhaps a less structured form of feedback. And I think the last thing uh, that, that people have talked about is that there are ways of using, uh, there are different softwares that allow uh, assessors to actually simultaneously mark up the script as they're talking to it. So you have a simultaneous video and audio recording. And this may well help uh, a large percentage of students understand or, or take home the message from this feedback. Right, and I think the last thing is to hand over to Sue Onans uh, for the general thoughts on uh, what this study shows us. Right, thank you very much, uh, Carl. Um, hopefully this presentation has given you more, um, some food for thought and raised some interesting questions. Uh, probably, uh, a range of questions that will um, be uh, you can reflect on. Um, building on what Carl and Vicky have spoken about, I'd like to discuss the broader considerations about feedback. It's clear from our research that students seem to value the personal touch which audio feedback could provide. This is particularly important now, creating a sense of belonging and being part of a community. Um, 
and now with the uncertainty of COVID. So again, that personal touch. Audio feedback has the potential to make both the academic and the student feel more connected, especially where physical presence may be limited. And I think that's a really important um, uh, thing to consider. In our study, the markers commented that they were able to provide more detailed, explicit and contextualised audio feedback in the same time allocated for written feedback. And the quality of the feedback was echoed by many of the students. And I think that's a theme that comes through. So whatever form of feedback is used, whether it's written, audio or video, needs to be accessible to a diverse range of students particularly those with disability and international students. We need to be mindful of the difficulties with multitasking and potential cognitive overload. Um, for some students with dyspraxia, as Vicky mentioned, switching from audio feedback to the electronic copy and finding their place can be problematic when trying to follow feedback. And in addition, I think we've all experienced Zoom fatigue recently, and it is likely that our students will be no different. It's important to strike a balance of accessible, relevant, personalised feedback that is detailed, feeds forward, but is not too overwhelming. And that getting that balance um, is, is right. So not too much detail, but sufficient detail to feed forward. Vicky spoke about some students with SPLDs preferring both a combination of audio and written feedback. Again, this is something that could be, that should be achievable given the pace um, of technology, as particularly since COVID. And, and as Carm just mentioned, that he has used VoiceThread, again, which students and, um, students and staff found positive. So it's, thinking about the future, thinking about how we can take the key messages from the study forward into our, and into our own institutions. Uh, Carl, if you could have the next slide, please. So this is the last slide, and I think it's important to remember that things in the context now, things that were deemed too difficult to consider or implement in the past now have become possible, or at least come to the fore in discussions. Perhaps the element of student choice over the form of assessment and what medium they would prefer to access their feedback in may be a real consideration in the near future. We are all on a learning journey at the moment and it is important to seek feedback from students on a number of issues. For example, how are they finding accessing and interacting, engaging with their course, their tutors and each other? What are their concerns? and whether they feel connected and where are the gaps. In the new normal, feedback in its widest sense is going to take centre stage. And the last question, which, is, um, which I'm posing, is somewhat contentious and brings us back to the study. How do we ensure that students see the value of feedback, engage with it, and use it to feed forward whatever the form it is provided in. And I've raised the question about actually the separation of marks from the feedback. Um, just to pose that question to think about, you know, the value um, that students place on the feedback. And are they too interested on in looking at the mark and discounting the feedback? So hopefully this brings together all the research um, and some general considerations. And thank you for your attention. Okay, and maybe the last thing I'd like to say is to thank the people that actually were also involved in this study as well. So we've done an awful lot of studies in a lot of different contexts here in Birmingham, and I'm not presenting all of these data. So I'd like to thank Adina Patia and Shazad Khan, who have looked at uh, um, uh, audio feedback in the context of international foundation year students. Uh, we presented some data from Andrew Soundy. This is a postgraduate physiotherapy process. We've got, uh, there's uh, Chris Lepis, who's one of our audio uh, assessors on biomedical sciences, and Keith Brain is another. Mary Christine Jones was an assessor on pharmacy. So the pharmacy data was generated by her. 
And we, what da some data that we haven't talked about was generated by Emilio Swift and Chris Wagstaff in nursing, and they were the ones that used voice thread, um, and the students really were very happy with the voice thread approach. So I think uh, that's time for us to wrap up, and obviously we're very happy to answer any questions.